Dear God, our thoughts are now on weighty matters having to do with what it means to be people of this nation. Help us open our hearts as we consider what it means to follow your lead. Amen. So we heard the story of Stephen the martyr. That word martyr has fallen on hard times, right? Um, we say, don't be a martyr, and our loved ones wince. Who likes to be accused of being overly dramatic, right? No one, but Stephen in the book of Acts was the real thing. And look, Stephen's story has a familiar ring to it. When they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he died. So the story we heard is a, a retelling of Jesus' crucifixion, right? And Stephen is absolutely Christ-like in his death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, another genuine martyr, is remembered to have said, when Christ calls someone, he bids him or her come and die. It's an awesome thing, is it not, when someone gives up his or her life for what they believe. My late beloved friend Leonard Zawoski was a prisoner at Auschwitz. And he told me of a day in July of 1941 when the deputy commandant of the camp ordered all the male prisoners brought out into the yard. And he said they were going to pick 10 men to execute because the day before, one person had escaped. So 10 were chosen quite randomly. And when one of the 10 cried out in despair, my wife, my children, Father Maxim Kolbe, also a prisoner, offered to die in the man's place, which he did, but not before offering all the comfort he could to the other nine. The martyr Stephen died alone at the hands of an angry mob. I think of the racist mob in Charlottesville a few years back and the death at their hands of the resistor, Heather Heyer. Stephen's stone throwers were religious, right? They were believers, like, like, like most of the mob on January 6th. Most of those folks interrupted their appalling mayhem long enough to pray together in the House of Representatives. Well, the first century mob had a theological problem with Stephen. In Acts chapter 6, it seems Stephen's only crime is performing, quote, great wonders and signs among the people. The religious leaders begin there to argue with him, and then they decide to persuade some folks to lie about him. <clears throat> That's how he ends up in such trouble. Still happening, that kind of thing, right? But there's more than Stephen and the mob in this martyrdom, right? There is also Saul, who will later be converted and become the Apostle Paul. He doesn't throw any stones, but he watches the coats of the stone throwers, remember? He doesn't get his hands dirty, but he sees what's going on. He doesn't yell and scream, but he hears all the noise. He doesn't do the deed, but he approves of it. By standing by and doing nothing, Saul validates what the mob is doing. The, the picture is artfully drawn by Luke, who tells the story. And we can see ourselves in Saul, can't we? Those times in which we have stood by, when we have acquiesced to something large or small, when we have held the coats of others, as Saul did. <clears throat> Our lives are so full of decisions, big and tiny, and we can't avoid responsibility. The, the decision to stand and do nothing but watch from a distance is, of course, itself a decision. When we sit on the fence, when we walk the tightrope, try to play the middle or hide behind not making a decision, we're making a decision. So let me tell you a story 
an extended story of such a time 83 years ago. I don't know, I don't know if there is a darker or more joyless branch of Christianity in the world than that of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They go door to door in neighborhoods and get spit on, get yelled at, screamed at, have doors slammed in their faces. Well, in 1940, they curried the hatred of the vast majority of Americans when they refused to salute the flag. And that's the story I want us to look at today. It involves a Jehovah's Witness named Walter Gobitis, who had two children, Lillian, aged 11, and Billy, aged nine. The two were expelled from school in Minersville, Pennsylvania, because they refused to recite the mandatory Pledge of Allegiance. Older sister Lillian was so proud of her little brother William, who, like her, remained silent during the pledge, but still stood ramrod straight in respect for the flag and his classmates. He stood there, she said, holding on to his pocket so he wouldn't fall over. The two were expelled for following the teachings of their parents and their church. Well, a long court battle ensued. The case of Gobitis versus Minersville School District reached the Supreme Court five years later in the spring of 1940. The witnesses' attorneys framed their arguments in religious terms, claiming that any statute contrary to God's law as they understood it must be void. The court rejected the witnesses' claim, though, holding that the secular interests of the school district in fostering patriotism were paramount. In the majority opinion, written during the same month that France fell to the Nazis, in fact, Felix Frankfurter wrote, quote, National unity is the basis of national security. The Jehovah's Witnesses, said Frankfurter, were free to fight out the wise use of legislative authority in the forum of public opinion and before legislative assemblies. So, in siding with Felix Frankfurter, the majority of our highest court refused to stand on the side of religious liberty. They made a choice. In a strongly worded dissent, Justice Harlan Stone argued that, quote, constitutional guarantees of personal liberty are not always absolutes, but, he said, it is a long step and one which I am unwilling to take that government may compel public affirmations which violate public conscience. He said conscience is above that, individual conscience. Well, the reaction in favor of this decision bordered on mass hysteria. Remember, it was 1940. American patriotism was at a fever pitch with the, the war in Europe looming. Some conspiracy theories, theorists, we, we had those back then too, said that the Jehovah's Witnesses were traitors who were probably Nazi sympathizers and saboteurs and maybe even spies. Now look, <laughs> they said that at the time when Nazis were putting Jehovah's Witnesses by the hundreds, if not thousands, in concentration camps all over Europe. More evidence that conspiracy theories, of course, are misguided, if not worse, right? So, what happened? Well, in Imperial, Pennsylvania, a town outside Pittsburgh, a mob descended on a small group of Jehovah's Witnesses and pummeled them mercilessly. One witness was beaten unconscious, and those who fled were cornered by axe and knife-wielding men riding the town's fire truck, of all things. Someone was heard to yell, get the ropes. In Penny Bunkport, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, the Witnesses' Church Kingdom Hall was ransacked and torched, and days of rioting ensued in Maine of all places. In Litchfield, Illinois, an angry crowd spread an American flag on the hood of a car and watched while a man repeatedly smashed the head of a Jehovah's Witness on that vehicle. 
In Rockville, Maryland, witnesses were assaulted across the street from a police station while the officers just stood and watched. By the end of that year, the American Civil Liberties Union estimated that 1,500 Jehovah's Witnesses had been assaulted in 335 separate attacks. The Supreme Court had, in fact, turned much of the nation into an angry and hateful mob. Well, many people in this country saw this happening and felt a lot like Saul in the story of Stephen. They hadn't participated in the violence, but they hadn't done anything to oppose it either. The conscience of the whole country was being tested. Well, it only took three years for the court to take another look at the question of the Pledge of Allegiance as it related to religious conscience. And that is quick in legal time, right? As World War II raged on, a new case involving Jehovah's Witnesses came to the Supreme Court. And instead of citing the Gobitis case as precedent and refusing to look at the question again, again, it had only been three years, the court decided courageously to see if they might have made a mistake three years before. Now, this is 1943. To most Americans, the pledge was a solemn affirmation of national unity, especially at a time when war wasn't just looming, right? No millions of U.S. troops were fighting and dying overseas. But the Jehovah's Witnesses insisted that pledging allegiance to the flag was still a form of idolatry akin to the worship of graven images prohibited in the Bible. The case this time was West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. Walter Barnett argued that the constitutional rights of his daughters Marie, eight, and Gathy, age nine, were violated when they were expelled from Slip Hill Grade School near Charlottesville, West Virginia, for refusing to recite the pledge. The landmark decision was written by Justice Robert L. Jackson, who was brand new to the court. And I love this. It was announced on Flag Day, June 14th. This time, the Supreme Court sided with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And here's what the majority ruling said. This is for the ages, people. To believe that patriotism will not flourish if patriotic ceremonies like the pledge are voluntary and spontaneous instead of compulsory and routine is to make an unflattering estimate of the appeal of our institutions to free minds. Justice Jackson said, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. And think about it. Jehovah's Witnesses were the least likely champions of religious freedom. I mean, in their kingdom halls, they do not say, as we do when we open our service each Sunday, wherever you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here. Not by a long shot. <laughs> no, Jehovah's Witnesses denounce all other religions and all secular governments as tools of the devil. They preach the imminent and violent return of Jesus during which no one except Jehovah's Witnesses will be spared. But their persistence in fighting in the courts for their beliefs has had a dramatic impact on our Constitution. They have tested our nation's tolerance of controversial beliefs over and over, and that testing in 1940 and 1943 woke this nation up to the fact that being willing to embrace religious diversity is what distinguishes our country from all tyrannical regimes. 
The earlier ruling in 1940 was seven to two against the rights of the Jehovah's Witnesses. In 1943, the ruling in favor of the Witnesses was by a vote of eight to one. One justice still held out. Yeah, and the only justice who got it right both times was Justice Harlan Stone, who by 1943 had become Chief Justice of the Court. Now, hear it again, this time again, written by Robert L. Jackson, the brand new guy to the court. Hear what he said again in that 1943 decision. It is as good as anything Abraham Lincoln ever said, and with such exactness and brevity too. Speaking again, remember, for the majority, he wrote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty shall prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. So just think of it. Eight old white men in black robes looked over that mahogany bench down at those two small children. And they said, you won. You go home now. And you listen to your parents. We Americans cannot be forced to believe anything. We cannot be forced to repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. We cannot be forced to support the Constitution or even the United States itself. You know what makes this a great country? It is exactly this, right? That's how secure we are. That's how strong our national backbone really is. That's what we are fighting for when we stand up against insurrectionists and horrible public officials who say they want to discard the Constitution, that it doesn't matter, it's not important, it doesn't apply to them, just throw it away. I mean, we are so secure, we can take a group like the Jehovah's Witnesses who believe America is of satanic origin and make defending them the cornerstone of our democracy. They are proof that we really believe in the freedom of religion. Absolute, undeniable truth. It's like Stephen the martyr using his last breath to defend those who stoned him when he said, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. That's how strong his faith was. That is proof of how much he was like the man who died before him on the cross. There is a lot of glib talk these days about freedom, right? It's my choice, people say, whether I wear a mask or not. It's my choice where I go with my assault rifle. People are not thinking. They don't know what this country is about. They have no clue what sacrifices people have made. They are acting narcissistically on impulse. There is a national epidemic of shallowness about us. I mean, there are people running for dog catcher and for Congress in nearly every state in this country who profess false piety and think they have to hold a Bible in their hands or wrap themselves in the flag to get elected. Well, most of us see through them, right? Not all, but at this point, still most of us. But you know, there was a time in this country only 80 years ago when we were bigger than that, when we knew what our country was really about and our leaders stood up for that. Today we hear many religious people running down the First Amendment, people who wish the Bill of Rights began with the Second Amendment. 
Well, if they knew any history at all, they'd know that the First Amendment pr promotes religion, it doesn't endanger it. Because you know, no, no state official can tell me what to say from this pulpit. Not even when I preached back in Utah. <laughs> and the same First Amendment guarantees that no public school teacher can fool with your kid's mind and get away with it. And I say, God bless America for that. Amen.